Today, Christian Family Sunday, I want to invite your family to come in and sit with you during this time of service, that they might feel the touch of God and the gift of prayer that we send their way this day. Our call to worship, creator, parent of the human family, we gather to worship you. In baptism, we are called beloved children of God. As such, we gather to worship you. Friends, neighbors, siblings in faith, we gather to worship in song, in prayer, in readings from your story, our story, and in thoughts and reflection. Let us worship God. We begin to do so by standing and sharing the opening hymn, Draw the Circle Wide. Let the dreams we dream be larger. 
than we've ever dreamed before. Let the dream of Christ be us open every door. Try a circle wide, try it wider still. Let this be our song, no one stands alone, and it's our traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, and the Mississaugas at the credit. We live, work, play, and worship the Creator on this land and acknowledge with respect the thousands of years of ceremony and relationship that are etched in footprints, fire, and faithfulness on the soil and rock that surrounds us. As we light this candle, may we be reminded we are not alone. We live in God's world. Call and God will come. Christ is here in the presence of this candle, our light in the world. Let us join together in prayer. God, creator of us all, we gather to worship you. We come as individuals. We come in family units. We come as neighbors and friends. We come here where we are known by name. Welcome by all our friendships and strengths. We gather with kindred spirits who long to live faithful to your law. Guide us, inspire us, challenge us, comfort us, and nurture us in this time of worship, so that we might be enabled to return to our daily lives, ready to engage fully with all of your creation. And we pray. Amen. Now we're going to stand and sing again. It's the song of Praise to the Maker, and I don't think I know it, right? So play loud. I always do. <laughs> Oh, 
Our scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 148. Praise for God's universal glory. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Praise him, sun and moon. Praise him, all you shining stars. Praise him, you heavenly heavens and your waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for he commanded and they were created. He established them forever and ever. He fixed their bounds, which cannot be passed. Praise the Lord from the earth, you sea monsters and all deeps. Fire and hail, snow and frost, stormy wind fulfilling his command. Mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, creeping things and flying birds, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all rulers of the earth, young men and women alike, old and young together. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above earth and heaven. He has raised up a horn for his people, Praise for all his faithful, for the people of Israel who are close to him. Praise the Lord. And our gospel reading today is from John chapter 13, verses 31 to 35, the new commandment. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am a little longer. You will look for me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us bow together in prayer. Holy and loving Creator, as we gather in your name, we ask you to come, be among us through the power of your Spirit, that your word read for us today may be written on our hearts, that we might remember them and live up to them. We are your people. We long to follow your will and your way. So come and show us our way. Amen. For me, friends, I've been reading this piece of scripture for a couple of weeks now. And I have to say that every time I read it, 
It speaks to me yet again in a new way. Today on Christian Family Sunday, I invite you to ask yourself, according to scripture, who sits on your throne? There's a little church on the Appian Way not far from the city of Rome that bears an interesting name. The word, the Church of Quo Vadis. The Latin words Quo Vadis means, whither goest thou? A beautiful legend has it that a few years after the crucifixion of Jesus, Peter had been in Rome and was under threat of persecution yet again. He was fleeing for his life. He was leaving the city in fear when he met Jesus. Jesus was heading into the city, so Peter asked him the question, Lord, whither goest thou? And the master answered, I go to Rome to be crucified yet again. And when I read the words, the words to be crucified yet again, I thought, uh-oh, are you following me, Jesus? Am I somehow letting you down? The legend has it that the answer so pierced the heart of Peter that it turned his cowardly, fugitive ways into a hero. And he followed his Lord back into Rome, where he gladly died. And you've probably heard that the tradition has it that he was crucified upside down on a cross at his own request because he felt he was not worthy to die as the Lord. So a little church has been built on the Appian Way on the spot where Peter fleeing Rome met Jesus coming back into the city, the place where he asked, whither goest thou? It is a legend, but the church is there to tell a moving story. I share this because the question that Peter asked the Lord in that story is the same question that Peter asked him in our scripture lesson. For Jesus was trying to talk to them about his coming death and his going away. Peter didn't understand, though he wanted to, and he asked Jesus, where are you going? Jesus told him he couldn't go with him. And in this story, all of the characteristics of this fascinating personality of Simon Peter are in operation. We see Peter's eagerness to be in front, his habit of blurting out his thoughts and feelings, his passionate love for his master, his inability to understand him, and his self-confident arrogance. But blindly and blundering, he lay hold on one thought. He knew that Jesus was departing and that he is to be left alone. So Peter asked the question, Lord, where are you going? Not so much caring about that as meaning by his question, tell me where and I will come too. I will follow faithfully. But Jesus knew all that because scripture tells us he knew what was in the minds and hearts of everyone. So he laid that hard word on Peter, a tough question. Would you lay down your life for me? Could there be a tougher question? Will you lay your life down for me? And we're back into the scripture. How much are you willing to give to be a true and faithful follower of the Christ? The question not only pierces the shallow thinking of Peter, it's a commitment question for all of us. It's relevant for us today. I'd like for us to come at the question one step at a time in order to capture the full meaning of it and struggle with integrity for an answer. Dr. Karl Barth was one of the premier theologians of this 20th century. And I believe it was Dr. Paul Tillich, another eminent theologian who 
commenting on this great and controversial thinker, said that Dr. Barth refused to become his own follower. And heaven help us, we're back in scripture again. Who are we following? Are we following the word, the will, the way of Jesus? Or are we following our word, our will, our way, claiming it's in his name? Karl Barth went on to point out that he had changed his mind about some things from time to time and that he steadfastly refused to take himself so seriously that he would eventually establish a school of thought. And I'm still stuck on it. He refused to become his own follower. Isn't that a temptation every one of us face, even though we don't often acknowledge it? We all are our own follower. We all want to do our own will, to go our own self-centered way without respecting any ultimate demands that might be made upon us. So the commitment question from Jesus comes in this form. Will you make my will your will? A noted theologian tells of a visit he once had with Mahatma Gandhi, the great shaper of modern India. After a time, the confrontation turned to spiritual matters. The theologian tactfully related to Gandhi his own personal experience of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Gandhi thought there, sat for a moment, and then lamented, my own throne is still vacant. And I think of the great Gandhi, and I find I'm saddened to think that he sees his own throne as vacant. But even sadder is those of us who see ourselves sitting on our own throne. Most of us know that the throne of our life is not vacant. We sit there. We seek to be the master of our fate, the captain of our souls. Charter Pichot has reminded us, if Christ is to have the throne of your being, he will get it only one way. He won't take it because you happen to leave it vacant. He won't take it by storm. He will get it because you give it to him deliberately, consciously, willingly, by choice. We often hear that Jesus turned the world upside down Perhaps it would be more accurate to say that he showed us that we live in an upside down world. Jesus slashed at the Pharisees, the very best of the Jewish community. He said, blessed are the meek, the hungry, the poor. In Jericho, he turned his back on leading citizens and stayed with a social outcast, a tax collector. He held as valued by God those whom the world despised. He showed us that alongside truth, the values of the world are inverted. This is what Jesus was telling us as he knelt to wash his disciples' feet. He was saying to us that this obedience to God, not that you become great in the eyes of the world, but is that you serve your neighbor. We sacrifice nothing, friends, when we serve others because, because God put us here to serve. When we reach out to our neighbor, we reach out to the highest value of human existence. For me, the second question rises, will you make my style your style? And this is the servant question. You know the setting. Jesus and his disciples are in the upper room celebrating Passover. Though the disciples didn't really know it, my hunch is that some of them must have suspected it. This would be the last Passover meal of Jesus. If they didn't know or suspect it, they knew something ominous was in the air. Something heavy was going on in Jesus' mind and heart. 
And yet, even in the midst of the foreshadowing of the cross, Jesus got up from the table and took upon himself the role of a servant. He girded himself with a towel, got a basin of water, and washed the disciples' feet. The style is clear, not only here, but throughout the gospel, the style of a servant. For me, I see two incidents took place in the Last Supper room in Jerusalem on the night before Jesus was crucified. In the first instance, he took red wine, symbols of his coming death, and handed them to his disciples. He gave the world these two sacraments of life, bread and wine, but they go with towel and basin. It's the amazing balance and wholeness of the ministry of Jesus. He tied them together, worship and work, giving and receiving, withdrawal and involvement, communion and service were all presented as one at the same time. So Jesus put the style of servant at the very heart of what Christian life is all about. The surest way we're told to find Christ is to turn our attention from our own concerns, even our own suffering, to the concerns and suffering of others. I love this line. Martin Luther used to say, our neighbor is the next person we need, and for that person we are to be Christ. That's what Jesus is trying to tell the disciples in the upper room. He's trying to show us how to live as servants and not be ashamed of it. An African native was asked on one occasion by a missionary, do you know Jesus? No, replied the native, but I know Tom Lanky, a friend of his. Tom was living the style of Jesus. And so that brings another question that will help us answer the big question. Will you make my style your style? Will you lay down your life for me? Will you make my love your love? This is not much different than a style question, but we ask it to underscore the very heart of commitment, laying down our lives for the sake of Jesus. Dr. Babcock, many years ago in a sermon said, if man cannot believe in Christians whom they have seen, why should they believe in Christ, who they have not seen? They will never see Jesus unless they see him in us. And that's you and me, friends. And we're back into this piece of scripture yet again. The only way anyone can see Christ is through a follower, one who lives and walks Christ's path. One of my favorite theater stories is about Charlie Chaplin, the great actor of the silent movie era. In 1950, he was directing a play at Circle Theater in Hollywood. He became frustrated at the way the rehearsal was going on stage. And to the surprise of all the actors, the great director leapt up out of his seat in the house, jumped onto the stage, pushed one of the actors off the chair, sat down and said, Excuse me, please. I want to sit here for a while. I need to see how it feels. Have you ever thought of sitting down in a seat reserved for Jesus Christ just to see how it feels? Does it suit you? That's the cue for us, friends. We need to seek and put ourselves in Jesus' shoes. And that's the place of others we walk with. We need to learn to feel what they feel. That's what being family is all about. Trying to understand what it would be like to walk in another's shoes. Not sympathy, but empathy is the dynamic of loving with the love of Christ. 
a story about a slow-moving panel truck and a narrow, winding road. A woman traveling out east got behind this slow-moving truck and because of the nature of the road, never had a chance to pass the truck. To make matters worse, the truck would stop and the driver would get out of the cab carrying a broom and he would proceed to beat on the side panels of the bed of his truck. After a few moments of this, he would return to the truck and drive on a few more miles, very slowly, until he would stop again and proceed to do the same thing with the broom. After 30 minutes of this, the lady got out of her car, went up to this man, hitting the sides of his truck with his broom, and as calmly as she could, she asked, why he continued to do this every few miles. The man replied, Ma'am, this is a one-ton panel truck. And in the back here, I've got two tons of canaries. If I can't keep half of them up in the air, I can't drive my truck. <laughs> is that what it's going to take for Jesus to get our attention? Beat the side of our truck with a broom? Sometimes I wonder, will the broom be enough for Jesus' power to be our power? For us to commit ourselves to being all that we were meant to be in his name. We can't be strong in our serving without receiving strength, which is beyond ourselves. We can't forever be out on the street giving away what we don't have. So Jesus asks, will you make my power your power? The story is told of an African Anglican bishop was asked to speak at a Christian conference in England. For many weeks, he did not respond to the written invitation. Finally, the corresponding secretary of the conference wrote an insistent note, we must know if you're coming, we need to make our plans. The bishop wrote back that he was still waiting for guidance on the Holy Spirit on the matter. He would let them know in four weeks. The exasperated secretary fired back this letter. Bishop, please don't bother. Cancel the invitation. We're not interested in having anyone speak to our conference who lives four weeks away from the Holy Spirit. Point well taken, isn't it? And so think about your life just for a moment. Who's in charge? Do you ever think about it, pray about it, and then try to live it? Do you get Jesus' message that he's offering a new heaven to all? Ask for yourself, where goest thou, Lord? And then decide. Will you follow? Or are you going to be too busy sitting on your own throne? The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to those who hear and understand his message. Amen. And now we're going to sing a delightful hymn that I do know. I see a new heaven. <laughs>
We will not be having a service here on the long weekend. It will be a, an online service. It will be a rerun. Um, you know, <laughs> there, there are services, that you, there are some Sundays that it just isn't worth trying. <laughs> and long, the first long weekend of the summer is momentum. So we will be back the weekend after for the music service. Um, my apologies, I won't be here. Uh, but again, and my thank you, the cookbook was wonderful. It was clear, it was easy to read. <laughs> and, and, and in large enough print that, that it was easy to read, which is good for those of us who are slightly older. Um, also, the uh, Sundays in August, there will be three Sundays, and all those services will be online as well. Some of you might remember, it gets very, very warm in this church in August. We, we think people watching online will be much more comfortable. Thank you. Thank you to those who share the life and work of the church. Many of you who missed yesterday, you need to know that it was a wonderful portrait of the Christian family in action. Everybody pitched in and helped anywhere and everywhere to make the day a total success. So on behalf of Birchcliff Bluff United Church, thank you, thank you, thank you. We give in many ways. God has blessed our lives with relationships, joy-inspiring and in challenging. In response to God's blessing in our lives, we have shared our offerings at the back of the sanctuary. We offer these gifts so that we might continue to build relationships with one another and with your whole creation. Bless these gifts that they may bring fullness and life abundance to all of your people. In prayer. Amen. And now, friends, the most important part of the service, the time when we come to God from our own special place. And we try to block out what's going on in our life and just bring to God those concerns which lie deep in our hearts. So as you get yourself into your God space, let us look at prayers of the people. Our faith blesses us with stories of others who have sought to live in life-giving relationships. As we remember these siblings in faith, remind us of your guidance and presence with us. Let us pray. Together we say, God of Moses, Aaron and Miriam, God of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, God of siblings who care for one another, offer support and challenge, celebrate together, work together, argue together, and grieve together. We are thankful for their witness, as they have done, may we also seek to live in a life-giving relationship with those we would aim as siblings. God of Eli, Hannah, and Samuel, cross-generational colleagues, mentors, and trusted leaders in faith, remind us of the opportunities we have to nurture and care, mentor and discern with one another in this faith community. May we embrace the trust that is offered and shared with respect, care, and humility. God of Ruth and Naomi, who embraced each other despite differences of race and cultural traditions and chose to be family for one another. For all who choose to be family, may your love and hope be sustained 
God of Simon and Andrew and James and John, who left the familiar to build new community with Jesus and his followers. Though faithful, they had moments of doubt, of fear, of denial. In our moments of doubt, fear, and denial, may we remember to trust and to take one step at a time. God of Hagar, Abraham, and Ishmael, God of Sarah, Abraham, and Isaac, God of the complicated, and the jealous, and the broken, remind us that this too is real and that you walk with us through these troubling times. God of Mary and John, call to relationships that stretch beyond blood to care for one another. You invite us to reach out and welcome, support, and care for one another. God of the past, God of the present, God of tomorrow, help us to live in relationships that seek justice, love our kindness, and realm ourselves in your love for us. And we continue to pray together, sharing in a paraphrase of the prayer that Jesus taught the disciples. We take a moment to remember those we keep in our prayers. As we remember those we keep in our prayers, Lord, we offer up especially this morning a little one who belongs to our community that has not had a good weekend. And we pray that her parents are given the strength to care for her and that you, through the power of your spirit, will make her well again soon. We ask this through Jesus Christ, who taught all followers to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, friends, we're going to stand and sing our closing hymn, Shall We Gather at the River? And Randy's going to have us bounce in it on our shoes. <laughs> and one thing that, I, that I'll mention, there's one verse in the traditional hymn that's missing from Voices United. So um, we're bringing it back today. <laughs> it's otherwise known as the obscene verse. <laughs> <laughs>
I heard you practice it. In baptism, you name us your beloved children, kin to one another. As we go from this place, please join me. May we know your love that found expression in the most vulnerable of human forms. Guide us, sustain us, and empower us into love. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.